Today on Cook's Country, Bridget and Julia cook Basque-inspired garlic fried chicken. Adam reviews inexpensive Dutch ovens with Julia, and Ashley makes Bridget the ultimate crispy Parmesan potatoes. That's all right here on Cook's Country. In 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue, and much of his crew was made up of sailors from the Basque region of Spain. A second, larger Basque migration happened later, during the gold rush of the 1800s. Today, California is home of the largest Basque American population. In Bakersfield, there's a group of restaurants referred to as the Basque Triangle, and the Pyrenees Cafe is one of the most popular. In particular, there's much love for their garlic fried chicken. So we headed to the Pyrenees Cafe to check it out for ourselves. They marinate the chicken overnight in a garlicky buttermilk mixture and then fry it over burners in 100-year-old vats. The result is juicy, flavorful, crisp chicken that evokes the bold and hearty traditions of the old country. Now, we don't have 100-year-old vats, but we developed an outstanding garlic fried chicken recipe that is guaranteed to spike the sale of breath mints. We're going to have tons of garlic flavor, and that was actually harder than a lot of people think because we didn't want garlic just on the outside. We wanted it to penetrate the chicken meat. So let's get over to the chicken before we get to the garlic. There's three pounds of chicken parts. It's like a party platter, <laughs> wings, Got whole legs and whole breasts. Now we want to cut down the leg quarters and the breasts to smaller sizes so that these will all cook at the same rate. And you like to go about two thirds of the way up because this half is much skinnier than the top. We just cut right through and now the leg quarters. You see this little demarcation of fat here. You can actually find exactly where that joint is. And that is that. Before we move on, I just want to wash my hands real quick. All right, let's move on down to Garlic Town. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna marinate the chicken in a garlic mixture. So it's gonna start off with three tablespoons of olive oil and fresh garlic first. This is five minced cloves. Hello. Quite a bit, but we're not just going to rely on that. We also wanna add a tablespoon of granulated garlic, which adds a much more mellow flavor. Now I've got a little salt and pepper here. It's two teaspoons of kosher salt and two teaspoons of black pepper. And I'll whisk all this together. So it's almost between a marinade and a paste. And notice you don't have any vinegar or anything acidic in this marinade because acidic things in marinades make the meat taste mushy. What you want in a good marinade is salt because salt will help the meat stay juicy. Perfect. Now as the chicken is going to sit in this marinade, it's going to exude some of its juices because of that salt. Granulated garlic is water soluble. So as that water comes out of the chicken, it's gonna mix with that granulated garlic and really bloom the flavor. Aha, very clever. Let's give this a good toss, make sure it's well coated. And if you can hand me a little piece of plastic wrap there, cover it up. It's going to go into the fridge for at least an hour, but it can go in for up to 24 hours. I took the chicken out of the bowl. It's marinated enough, but I do want to take some paper towels and get any big pieces of garlic because we don't want that to scorch in the oil. Let's talk breading. All right. What I've got here is four egg whites. Just take a fork and lightly beat them. Sometimes we just use whole legs, but why take the yolks out of this? We got rid of the egg yolks because they contained fat and the fat prevented the flour coating from really sticking to the chicken. Plus later on, we also are going to add this garlic butter mixture. Oh, hello. So we need a real substantial crust to hold up to that. Let's talk a little bit about our flour. It's two cups of all-purpose flour, the tablespoon of granulated garlic, more garlic flavor, more, mm -hmm. more. We have two teaspoons of kosher salt and two more teaspoons of black pepper. Oh, hello, so it has a little <laughs> kick to it. It does. Let's start dredging. Start with my favorite part. Oh yeah. The chicken wing. Get it really well coated with that egg white all over. Always a good idea to let any excess drip off. And then into the flour. So if you wanna help me out, go ahead and get in there, get that wing, but I want you to Ooh. press some of that flour onto the chicken. Oh, really? Like really just press it on. We wanna make sure that that <laughs> coating adheres. I see, I got the messy part. It's not fried chicken unless you get lots and lots of breading on your apron. Mm -hmm, I agree. I mean, the kernel was covered in flour. <laughs> it was actually a brown suit. That's right. <laughs> that looks perfect. All right, 
And we are placing these on a wire rack because we want them to kind of dry out a little bit. And I'll explain that in just a moment after we get finished with our breading. We're gonna let this sit in the refrigerator uncovered. While it's in there, some of that moisture is going to be drawn out from both the chicken and the egg white. It's gonna mix with that flour and really form a glue. You don't wanna skip this step. It needs at least 30 minutes and up to two hours. Okay, I'm gonna go wash my hands. That sounds good. It's frying time. <laughs> it's your party. It you is. can fry if you want it. I love frying <laughs> just about anything, but fried chicken is definitely the best thing. So this is out of the fridge, and you can see it's changed in the way it looks a little bit. The flour and some of the moisture from that egg wash, it's kind of clinging together, definitely gonna stick to the chicken. So we've got three quarts of peanut oil. You can use vegetable oil if you rather. We've heated it to 325 degrees. We're gonna fry the chicken in two batches. That way we don't crowd the pan. The oil temperature isn't going to drop too much. If it drops too much, and this is a common mistake that a lot of people make, you can end up with really, really greasy fried chicken. We want it to stay between 300 and 325. Also don't want it to climb much above 325 because you'll end up with a burnt coating and underdone chicken. These are going to need to cook for about 15 minutes. And what we're looking for is the Ooh. breast meat to cook to around 160 degrees, and then the drumsticks and the thighs to come out right around 170, 175. Of course, the wings might come out a little bit sooner. It's always a good idea to temp that chicken. These have been cooking about 15 minutes. Time to get them out of oh. that hot oil. Oh, goodness, they're gorgeous, Bridget. Oh, oh yeah. And we're gonna let these rest on paper towels. Got that over a wire rack. So first batch out. And now we're going to fry the second batch exactly the same. I do wanna let this oil come back up to 325 before I add the rest of the chicken and they'll go about 15 minutes. Let's get this second batch. Mm, that means it's close to eating time. That's right, out of the oil into our mouths. And we'll let this hot fried chicken fat just cool down before I take a bath in it a little later on. <laughs> in the meantime, we're making a garlic butter. Exactly. Hello. One of the things that we worried about was when we melted all the butter, it just made the whole chicken very greasy and also sogged out that crust. Hmm. So we're going to do a little bit of a clever trick. We're gonna start off with softened butter. It's seven tablespoons of unsalted butter. Mix in a little bit of parsley. It's two tablespoons of minced parsley. A quarter teaspoon of kosher salt. A quarter teaspoon of black pepper. And I'll go ahead and mash all this together. But you can see it's going to be really difficult to spread this all over fried chicken, so we're gonna to need to do something about this. Wanna move with me over here? I've got you moving all over the place. <laughs> we're going to add another tablespoon of butter to a skillet. So this melted butter is going to mix with that softened butter and it's going to make an emulsion. So it's going to sit on top of the chicken and be really creamy instead of greasy. That is clever. I think it is. So we're not just going to cook butter over here, we're gonna cook eight cloves of garlic that are minced. Right Ding. in there. <laughs> That's a lot of garlic. <laughs> well, cooking it's going to soften the flavor, but we don't want it to scorch. So we're also going to add a tablespoon of water. That's going to give that garlic time to kind of lend some of its flavor to the butter and also soften its bite. Mm -hmm. So just a minute or two, really, until we start to really get a good whiff of garlic. It's almost there. Let's move this hot butter mixture to our cold butter mixture. If you wouldn't mind whisking mm. that together for me. But you can see it's a really creamy texture. Yeah. It doesn't look like melted butter at all. No. Very clever. So I'll go ahead and platter up our beautiful fried chicken. Now as I move it, you can really hear that crackling coating. Yeah. That coating's really on there. <laughs> oh I'm gonna spoon goodness. this right over the top. This is amazing. I know it looks awful, doesn't it? We should just eat it and get rid of it all for everyone else. I'm gonna be barely able to eat half of that. Good. Save the other half for me. Tuck in, Julia. It's all, all right. yours. <laughs> oh my goodness. This is so good. The garlic is really all the way through the chicken, but like you said, it's not knocking my head off. And listen to this. Still crispy. Yeah, that's what's so amazing. I mean, the butter is on top, mm. but the chicken crust is still crisp. Mm -hmm. To make this garlicky Basque style fried chicken, start by marinating the chicken for at least one hour in a mixture of olive oil, minced fresh garlic, and granulated garlic, along with some salt and pepper. Then, after brushing off the marinade, coat the chicken with egg whites and dredge it in flour seasoned with more garlic. 
Let the coated chicken chill in the refrigerator for 30 minutes, then deep fry it until golden brown and crisp. And last but not least, spoon garlicky butter over the chicken just before serving. And there you have it, the ultimate recipe for garlic fried chicken. Huh? I'm on my second piece. <laughs>。Everyone here at Cooks Country loves these large Le Creuset Dutch ovens, but they cost a pretty penny. So the question today for Adam is: Are there any less expensive options on the market? In fact, there are many less expensive Dutch ovens on the market, Julia. You know that one is a fantastic Dutch Ooh. oven, but it's three hundred and sixty dollars. Not everybody can make that kind of investment. We were trying to find a good alternative. We came up with this lineup of seven pots. We set a price cap of $125, so none of them are more than a third the cost of the Lake Crusade. Yeah. And we chose pots that were six to eight quarts in capacity. Now the cooking tests: testers boiled water, cooked rice, fried French fries, braised meat, and even baked bread in these guys. There was also some abuse testing that went on to try and get at the durability of an enamel coating if there was one. So testers scrubbed at them repeatedly and hard with an abrasive sponge. They took a metal spoon and whacked the rims of these pots. I know, so sad for them. And you ready for this one? You know what's coming up? <laughs> testers took the lids and slammed them down onto the pot repeatedly, so just like.、Fun. Are you ready? Yep. <laughs> Look what happened with some of these. You get flakes of enamel、oh, all、wow. over the surface there.、Oh. They came right off. That would not stand the test of time. No, it certainly would not. Now, in terms of the cooking tests, most of the cast iron contestants performed on par, but there were a couple of design factors that testers identified that made a real difference. And one of them was they preferred pans that had straight sides as opposed to pans like this one. Where the sides curve in to meet the bottom of the pan, so the difference was 10 inches of usable cooking surface on the straight-sided pan versus seven and a half inches here. Oh wow! That makes a real difference in cooking. If you're browning meat for stew, that can be the difference between two batches and three or four. That can save you up to 15 minutes. Absolutely. Two of the pots in the in the lineup were aluminum. They're the two right in front of you, the silver one and the red one. Why don't you pick that one up? Woo! Really lightweight, right? <laughs> It that is. That was just about. Four pounds. It was also the least expensive one here at just twenty-four dollars and twenty-nine cents.、Oh, right. That one tended to scorch, and in the durability tests, it dented. Now there was another important design factor, and that was the handles. You know, if you are pulling、mm -hmm. a Dutch oven full of stew or a braise out of the oven, those are not good moments to lose your grip. I want you to put on those oven mitts and try the little tiny skimpy handles on that silver Dutch oven. Ooh, that doesn't feel so secure. It does. A little slippery, a little small. The handles have got to be、yeah. bigger and、mm -hmm. surer for a really firm grip. In the end, we did identify a really good Dutch oven that's a lot less expensive than the Le Creuset, and that one is the Cuisinart seven-quart round-covered casserole. It's a hundred and twenty-two dollars. Pretty good. And it did a terrific job. It cooked on par with the Le Creuset. It's got the shape that we like. You've got a broad cooking surface. It was good and solid, and at just a hundred and twenty-two dollars, it's really a good deal. There you have it. Although we will always love our Le Creuset Dutch ovens for just a third of the cost, look out for a Cuisinart seven-quart round-covered casserole. Here at Cooks Country, we've got a most requested list for the foods and recipes that viewers, you guys, cannot get enough of. Now, among those greatest hits are potatoes and cheese, specifically Parmesan. And when you add the word crisp to the equation, well, you've got a Hall of Fame char topper. So this recipe goes out to all you crispy potato Parmesan lovers out there, and you know who you are. <laughs> <laughs> But first, I want you to taste one of these. This is called Frico, and this is the result of when you finely grate really good quality Parmesan cheese and you melt it in a nonstick skillet or an oven, and it melts into the most beautiful lacy. Cracker, the best cracker you could ever have because it's made just with cheese. Right. What I'm going to be showing you here today is how to put this frico onto these sliced potatoes. Not just going to dump them right on. No. Okay. <laughs> That would be a different recipe. 
We're gonna start with Yukon Gold Potatoes because they're much creamier, they're not as starchy as russet potatoes. It's two pounds and make sure you're getting large ones that are about two to three inches a piece. And that's gonna ensure that they're all gonna cook at the same rate. You're gonna see that they are rounded on either side and just to make sure that you are safe, cut the top and bottom, and that's gonna give a nice flat surface so that this isn't rocking around anymore. Very, very safe. I'm gonna just continue to cut these potatoes into half inch thick slices. Next, mix two teaspoons of cornstarch, one teaspoon salt, and one teaspoon of freshly cracked black pepper. Now the cornstarch is just as important as the potatoes and the cheese in this recipe. It's gonna act as a moisture absorber and it's also gonna act as a glue for the Parmesan cheese to make sure that frico forms on these potatoes. So this helps with the crispy part of the equation. Yep, that's exactly right. So I'm just gonna mix this here with a fork and I'm gonna add them to my sliced potatoes here. And using this rubber spatula, I'm just gonna mix this all together so that the cornstarch evenly coats each piece. So there's hardly any cornstarch that went in there, so mm -hmm. really taking the time to make sure that it's all coated is very important. Mm -hmm. Now you'll see we have one tablespoon of extra virgin olive oil, so I'm just gonna drizzle that on here and do the same again. Just make sure everything's nice and coated. All right. Mm -hmm. Here you can see we have a, um, thank you, You're rimmed welcome. baking sheet that we've sprayed really liberally with some vegetable oil spray. Now don't skip this step if you make it at home. It takes a long time to scrape Parmesan cheese <laughs> off of the bottom of your rimmed baking sheet. So I'll transfer these here, every little bit from the bowl. And using this rubber spatula, I'm just gonna move these slices around so they all get contact with the sheet pan. I have a preheated 500 degree oven and these are gonna go in there for about 20 minutes until nice and golden brown. Super hot. Super hot. Okay, so what goes better with any chip than a proper dip? Yeah, because these are kind of like chips, right? Exactly, they're super, super crispy. Here we're gonna make a sour cream based dip. Yum. So we have one cup of sour cream, quarter cup of minced fresh chives, half a teaspoon of minced fresh rosemary, half a teaspoon of salt, half a teaspoon of pepper, one half teaspoon of garlic powder, and a quarter teaspoon of onion powder. So I'm just gonna whisk this until combined. I'm gonna warn you now, this is some addicting <laughs> stuff. Okay, that looks great. Now I'm gonna cover this, put this in the fridge for about 30 minutes to chill. Okay. Now it's time to make the cheesy part of the crispy Parmesan potatoes. Here we have a six ounce wedge of really good quality Parmesan cheese. It's really important just to spend the extra dollar or so to get the good quality stuff. Go big or go home. Exactly, my kind of girl. <laughs> I am gonna start by cutting off this rind. And I like to freeze any Parmesan rinds because it's really good to add to soups or any kind of tomato sauces that I'm gonna make in the future. I'm gonna cut these into one inch cubes. Add these to the food processor. Here we have two teaspoons of minced fresh rosemary and the remaining two teaspoons of cornstarch, half a teaspoon of black pepper. And I'm gonna process this until everything is finely grated, which will take about one minute. Okay. That cheese looks nice and finely grated. I'm gonna leave this cheese over here, but in the meantime, I'm gonna grab those potatoes. I can hear them singing to us. Yes, now we have crispy potatoes, but not crispy parm Right. Potatoes. Now all of this cheese is about to go all over these potatoes. And you can be as messy as you want because you want the cheese to fall in between each and every piece. <sighs> I love that we're not stingy here at Cook's Country. We're <laughs> absolutely smothering these potatoes with that cheese mixture, which by the way, smells incredible too. Oh yeah, with that rosemary. <sighs> yeah. So using this dinner spoon, I'm gonna go along to each slice and press the cheese into it, being sure not to move the potatoes too much because you wanna keep that cheese surrounding it. And to make you wait even longer, using these two forks, I'm gonna go through and flip each one so that the cheese I just pressed in is gonna hit the rim baking sheet. Ah. I'm gonna put these back into the oven for five to seven minutes until I see everything nice and golden brown. <gasps> oh, yes. Bubbling, bubbling, crispy, crispy potatoes. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we have to let these cool. So after 15 minutes, we'll come back and we will be ready to eat. 
Okay, it's been 15 minutes. Yes, it has. And using a spatula, I'm gonna shimmy my way through and release the frico from the sheet pan. All right, and no doubt about it, the frico is sticking to the potatoes. Just for good measure, I'm just gonna release a few more bits. <laughs> this is so beautiful. <laughs> I'm so excited. Yes. Oh, a little sauce on the side. On the potatoes, please. Right on the potatoes. Thank you. All right. See that? That's beautiful. Just a crispy potato, mm -hmm. you know, nice and brown. Hello. Hello. The frico on that <laughs> side. That is incredible. So I lied. I'm going to take two. <laughs> Crunch. Check. Check. I can't even talk. What is this like? I'm trying to think cheese fries. Mm-hmm. Twice baked potato, mm -hmm. fried chicken. And chip and dip. And <laughs> chips and dip. <laughs> oh my gosh. You can be chip and I'll be dip. Ooh, I like that. Halloween next year, okay? Mm. And that sauce though, it's so nice and creamy. You're right. It's very addictive. Mm -hmm. Ashley, you've changed my world. My new very favorite potato dish. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Definitely thank you for the best crispy Parmesan potatoes. And I mean best. You've got to start with two pounds of Yukon Gold potatoes and cut them into half inch slices. Season them with salt and pepper and toss with cornstarch to help those spuds stay crispy in the oven. Then whip up a quick and easy and delicious sour cream dip with plenty of fresh chives, powdered onion, and granulated garlic. Sprinkle the potatoes with lots of Parmesan and throw them back in the oven until that cheese is golden and forms the beautiful frigo that we are all looking for. So there you have it from Cook's Country, the very best crispy Parmesan potatoes. You need this recipe and you can get this recipe and all the recipes from this season along with our testings, tastings, and selected episodes at cookscountry.com. More potatoes. Oh, mommy. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for watching Cook's Country from America's Test Kitchen. So what'd you think? Leave a comment and let us know which recipes you're excited to make or just say hi. Now you can find links to today's recipes and reviews in the video description. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel. See you later. Alligator. <laughs>